Unmute or you? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. So we're, we're good now. Okay. I'm good. I'm so right. we're recording. Yep. Okay. 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 For plans to okay. Welcome everyone to the December 2nd, 2022 Long Range Planning Committee meeting. Uh, we're here at Council Chambers B. I uh, have a couple members uh, also watching online, I believe, or a couple members of the public. Um, First item on tonight, today's agenda is to review the minutes of November 4th, 2022. Any comments or a motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Okay. Vote. We need to do a formal vote. Five. All in favor? Yep. One, two, three, four, five. I'm abstaining. I was, I was ill that day, it turned out. Uh, second item on the agenda, GMO questionnaire and responses. All right, so I apologize. We were going to get into commercial design standards this time, but <laughs> we are not. We are going to do a, a questionnaire as a group with our long range planning hat on. Um, a couple of you have seen this presentation already this week. I think this is the fifth <laughs> one. So if, I apologize for the repetitive, repetitiveness, but Put your long range planning hat on and we'll try to work through this um, as a group. And the goal is to give a consolidated answer back to council. So in October, um, the Downs, as I'm sure you all know, had been going through a year long exemption process with council and public benefit had come up. There were a lot of issues really trying to trying to address the, the public benefit, the exemption process. Um, in October, there was a conclusion for that immediate question for the downs, but it was decided at town council that, hey, we're going to take a break and we're going to go look at this. So they assigned John Anderson and Nick McGee um, to do a, a task uh, to go look at this until April. They're working with myself, Karen Martin, and Tom Hall um, to get input and really try to figure out a GMO, a growth management ordinance that works for everything and correlates with the comp plan and the goals of the town. So this first part is a public outreach and we're tapping into all of our resources with committees and boards that we have, um, department staff. And so we've put this out with a deadline of December 23rd. So that means everybody had to make a little bit of change for their December meeting, um, but that's where we are. Um, the GMO summary and on your paper copy, the GMO ordinance itself is many pages long, but in a nutshell, there's really three parts to it. Um, there's an annual allocation, and this is a really specific number that is decided on every two years. There's exemptions that I would say are just sort of your basic across the board exemptions, kind of easy to look at. And then there's the exemption process, and that's a tricky one. So we put the questionnaire um, together so you could we could try to address each topic, kind of break it down into bites that were um, easier to, to manage question answers to. So the annual allocation, that's the first part. This is the one that has that fixed number. And right now we're working with 144. Uh, there's no more than 30 of those can be in the rural district. And that's really to preserve that west of the turnpike RS zoning. Um, we also have a cap of 20% of the total permits can be in a common scheme. So in any year, if a large scale developer came in with a master plan community, um, it sounds great, but the way this is written, they could only do 29 permits each year, the way the GMO is written. And then the Downs gets 30% of those, so they have 43 as it's written. The exemptions include uh, repair and replacement units. I think those are pretty straightforward. Um, there's affordable housing units. Um, all affordable housing units are exempt right now. And then with uh, up to 10 workforce housing units are exempt right now. Manufactured housing and licensed um, communities are allowed. We also have a one bedroom multifamily up to 750 square foot unit there's a cap of 100 and it has a time limit. So it's not an annual allocation right now it's written. It's written for uh, a certain period of time. And then the last bullet is how the crossroads plan development was addressed 
for the time being. So they have 289 units um, for the end of 2025 that they can do multifamily mixed use. And that was to really get the town center going. So, and then there's the exemption process. And that is the one that's a little trickier. Uh, the exemption process, as it's written, you have to be in the designated growth area. And the designated growth area is essentially route one. I mean, it really is. <laughs> West of the turnpike, turnpike, route one, growth there. Um, and the unit's part of mixed use or multifamily, and there's some sort of public benefit provided. So, and this is meant to be a jump in and answer. So once we start talking about these questions, um, please feel free and Eric's typing away and we'll go back to the recording and the plan is to gather your input in this and then do our best with what we got and then distribute it back out and make sure that we heard you all correctly before we pass it on. So the um, first two, oh uh, yes. The, the, the um, designated growth area, is that the same map that we use as, okay. Yes. Yeah. yes. And Autumn, you mentioned that the, um, the, the um, 30 units in the rural was just west of the turnpike. So that doesn't include the rural. It's in the RF, okay. but it's essentially, there's, there's a little bit of crossover. Well, there's a big RF in two around um, Pleasant Hill between Pleasant mm -hmm. Hill and Beach. So I just wanted to make sure that's part of the. Yes, any okay, so RF. Got it. Okay. Good, good clarification. Thank you, Peter. Um, questions one and two have to do with not thinking about growth, not thinking about numbers, just for long range planning, and I know the answer, it's okay, <laughs> but it's on here. Does the number of new residential units affect your decision making, you know, when you think about things? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Peter's part. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I know obviously the question is yes. And, but why does the number of residential units affect long range planning? It's, it's an interesting way of phrasing the question because as stewards of the comprehensive plan, um, I think we're partially a voice for the comprehensive plan to, to remind the, the, the town council and who sets those numbers of what the comprehensive plan says about our targets for growth and the rest. How it affects us, it would affect us obviously as we change or prepare for the next comprehensive plan, but as it is right now, we have a comprehensive plan and we're, we're the voice of that in the setting of the number of units that get developed in a given year. Does that make sense? It kind of mm -hmm. turns the question a little bit out of its head, but it feels like that's our role. But I think if we go down another layer, um, most often we look at potential changes to our ordinances to make recommendations to the council in terms of how we feel those ordinances will play out in a given situation. Mm -hmm. And this obviously would have an impact on that as well. So the higher the number, maybe we need to prioritize this ordinance change versus yeah. this ordinance change. Or if we're seeing this kind of development come in, more multifamily than single family addressing that. Right, okay. and yes. Okay. So it's not necessarily that the number is a good or bad thing, it's just that it sort of guides your work throughout. Well, then I can jump on that. I think commercial drives residential and the residential drives commercial. So it's an endless journal. <laughs> got, got a supply boat yeah. in order to uh, you know, maintain a balance of taxable revenue and feed those commercial industries in town. Yes, I see it a little bit I mean, I've always thought of this committee as focused on, in a macro sense, where things happen. Mm -hmm. Where do we think residential growth happens? Where do we think commercial growth should happen? The GMO being in place really doesn't, I mean, whether we would say, well, we want to have residential growth here or here. Or here, the GMO applies in any event. I'm not sure we would necessarily be thinking about, well, we don't want to have as much residential growth in this particular area because the GMO will limit the number of units that can be built in that area. So I don't, personally, I don't 
see that this is a direct, there's a direct correlation between GMO and how we look at how in terms of where the seeds are developed or sugar. Yeah, so the GMO should follow this. The GMO, plan, but we wouldn't say, well, but, we wouldn't, let's not allow residential right. growth gotcha. here because of the GMO. Okay. Understood. Although I think it, 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 the, the point though, by zone, we probably do make some statements about that. So, like, mm -hmm. we only have we limit the number of of permits that are allowed in the rural in RF and RFM um, is part of that. We could, in theory, do that for other zones. For but I'm not sure we'll restrict anything in R two, but, but some of the other zones might or overlay zones might end up having a, a key in a, a, might key into the GMO in that way. Um, but I think you're right, Rick. I think it's 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 kind of at a macro level. It's not at a at a you know we want 40 units in Dunstan. Um, we, we you know it's it's not at that level by any means. Right. That's what that's my only comment about question one is the the addition of each year uh, does the number of new residential units constructed each year directly. But I don't think it does. I don't think we're on a year by year basis unless that means. And I can't remember in my two years here if we've ever talked about something such as rate of growth. I can't, I can't remember brought that. up a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, as a, yeah, as yeah. a, as a, as a, as a subject. Uh, so if it, <clears throat> yes, if it, if it, you're talking that way, but otherwise I'd say no, not on a year by year basis. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so with the next question has to do, um, if the type of housing has an effect on this committee making decision. So multifamily versus single family, if that has any difference or if it's sort of seen as the same thing for the purpose of this group. No, I think there is a yeah. big difference. Yeah. yeah. Um and, and we've talked a lot about um not just as simple as single family versus multifamily, but also mixed use development. Mm -hmm. And and should there be um, a, a differentiated category for units that are a part of a mixed growth development. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk about design standards today, but um, when that comes up, I think this will be a critical, uh, both design um, standards and the definition of what type of building stock we have will be critical elements for us. Does the number though, does it have an impact other than in the work that we do to Alan's point that it sort of drives our ordinances and our reviews or does it mean um and I'm I'm just trying to get more details um I don't see does, a number question on this one then. Um, well it goes so. with um does the effect so I think you, the allocation does okay so maybe not the absolute number but the allocation within that number um could twist away from what we're trying to do from a comp plan, um, uh, 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 from staying true to the comp plan. Okay. Um, so if we had, make enough numbers here, we had 300 units in the GMO, um, 25 um, in RF and RFM districts, um, and we allocate 275 for R2, leaving 100 for mixed use or multifamily. That's probably taking us a bit away from the comp, the comp plan, yeah. which is trying to develops more centers of, of, of so it's almost yeah, okay i got you so you're saying the gmo is a tool to implement zoning in some respects and or that, maybe not they, zoning it's a tool to implement the comp plan i mean it's, it's one of the tools that helps it's, steer the town towards the comp plan vision it should definitely not contradict and yeah I'm definitely not right contradict now i think it that. contradicts a bit and i think that's what we're trying to alleviate is that the comp plan says Develop, provide affordable housing, look at your growth rate, you know, um, growth corridors, and then the GMO as it's written right now says, mm, not that many <laughs> right here. <laughs> and don't do a big project. Yeah. But we also want all these other things that come with the big project. So it is trying to find that balance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think it's a really good way of saying it, it shouldn't contradict the comp plan. Maybe not, the, it, it doesn't marry to the comp plan, but it shouldn't contradict it. It's getting away from the GMO question itself slightly. The way that I see that this has impacted this committee over the term that I've been on it has not been quantity as allowability in a given zone. Okay. So that's different from. So a little bit, yeah, a little. Uh, it, 
it's different from the GMO question, but in terms of what have we addressed more often than not is, is should this be an allowable uh, item within this zone? So zoning is the main growth management tool. Correct. Right. But I think sometimes we do forget that, that there's an umbrella of growth management tools. It's not, you know, that the, <coughs> what we call the GMO is not really it's not, it's not really the a growth management sure. ordinance. It's a rate of growth ordinance, which is a tool to implement your other growth management programs. Right. right. It's specifically workforce and affordable housing in a multifamily type of development. I think it's a, it's what I think of in my head is getting more affordable housing and workforce housing, but it ends up being a multifamily type of building. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's go to question four then, since you brought up the affordable and workforce housing. I'll do this. Sorry, I'll skip around. Um, so number four um, is about the exemption. And so the exemptions are pretty clear, um, repair and replacement. And, you know, if you see anything wrong with allowing one for one repair and replacement, let me know. But the affordable housing unit is important, I think. Actually, right. On that one, that's the one for repair and replacement, not the new gift loss. Oh, um, okay. We don't have very many of those. Yeah, Maybe just there one. used to be a every, lot. Yeah, uh, there's so. not very many now. Okay. Uh, okay. I've, I've made sure with our permit department, like we don't see that a lot. So okay. I don't think it's a yeah, huge. My part of Blue Point has a lot of historically gift lot mm -hmm. properties, gotcha. but you're right, there's not much left to do that. Yeah, but right. yeah. And that's probably RF. Yeah, you got them in RF, right? Yeah. Um, so the affordable housing units right now, all affordable housing units are allowed, but there's no tie to their affordable housing is defined, but there's no requirement for deed restriction. Right. So there's a little bit of um, a, a twist there, you know, like, oh, great, it's affordable first blush, but then what if we don't yeah. tie something else to it? Um, so the other piece of that um, <clears throat> is that right now there's a new, a new update, twenty thousand dollars. So a developer can come in right now with these present ordinances, get a higher density so, because they committed to putting out many, many affordable housing, and then pull back, pay the twenty thousand dollar new update, and get greater density. So that instead of building a two hundred thousand dollar house, they build a nine hundred thousand dollar house. So the twenty thousand dollars is a cheap way to get yeah. more expensive houses mm -hmm. in a smaller spot. And until we close that gap and either have some kind of deed restriction or um, commitment to a vesta or habitat or something that drives that to be actually implemented, we're going to continue to have housing stock problems. We need to increase the minimum fee, absolutely, or make it more strange. Great, yeah. Um, or, or both. Or yeah, both. Or yeah. Both, yeah. So it sounds like affordable housing is a good thing to for this group to leave in as exemption, but tie up the loopholes behind it in the ordinance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's definitional. Yes. Yeah, change the definition. Okay. Include them for well, yeah, well, well, the duration. In other yeah. words, mm -hmm. this apartment is affordable for the next 40 years. Right, and if the, if the first person family gets promoted, the income grows out of that, then uh, out of the affordable, then the developer owes another apartment for affordable. Okay? In other words, make sure that if you say there are 10 affordable apartments, make sure that there are always 10 affordable apartments. Right. Can somebody help me with the differentiation between affordable housing and workforce housing? Yeah, yeah that was. I haven't screenshot it. Yeah, yeah. Still, there's so two different definitions. 80%. I'm oh, sorry, John. No, 80. So the vote keyed off of the right. area median income. Okay. The workforce goes up to 120%. I think it's from right. 80 to 140. Yeah. And the affordable is 80. below 80. 80. That might vary if it's owned versus rented. No. And so um, and, and it's area income, but not town income? Correct. It's area. It's a combo income. It's a high number. Gotcha. Okay. All right. 
right now the max is uh, yeah, a family right. income of yeah, I'm yeah. sure I just I can send you the numbers. All right. <laughs> it's, <laughs> not, uh, it's not a it's, it's going to take a couple of days to get it. It's, uh, it did for me anyway. To understand the definition. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why I screenshot the other. I'm like, okay, this is a yeah. got to read this. But um, where is the in Pardon me. What you said, John? GMO, I don't see it. it. It's the density. It's a density. It's a density. More it's, it's not in the. It's in the zoning. It's, it's in zoning. Four, chapter four or five. Mm -hmm. There's I a lot of little tucked in loopholes that I think we're trying to close up. <laughs> but I think what's been great about this, especially for me being new, is going to these different groups and like, oh, there's one we need to fix. Oh, <laughs> there's one we need to fix. You know, like all the yeah. ideas are. I'm finding that the the goals and the ideas are very similar, but it's the how tos that have been tricky along right. the way, right? So I think that this is a really Good exercise for the CMO, but also for long range planning. And you guys are going to be really busy next year. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> we'll, we'll invite you back. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yes, I will yes. be on over. Okay, then you'll be just as busy. <laughs> <laughs> and it just in terms of being consistent with the comp plan, what the comp plan does ask is it doesn't mandate a growth manager mm -hmm. or a rate of growth ordinance. What it does say is if you do have a rate of growth ordinance, you have to evaluate it against all of these different policies, like mm -hmm. housing and you know economic development and transportation. So the the council has to, in its you know wisdom, think about the GMO or the rate of growth ordinance as it applies or as it damages or helps any of these other policy mm -hmm. areas. So that's what the comp plan does. It 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 says can't think about the the rate of growth ordinance. All on its own. Fortunately, it's the council's job now. <laughs> but that's part of what I think each of the committees is going to help the council do. We need that with housing mm -hmm. and really? all of that. They can um, give you those policy, get that policy information. What gets more eyes yes. on the yes. issue so that you don't get too narrow a vision. Right. Says, okay, if we allow X number of houses, How's that going to affect traffic? How's exactly. that going to affect um, tax base? How is that going to affect all these different things? Yeah, we can't all be operating in silos. So right. I think the idea is to bring it all out. So I think it's it's really exciting, it's really positive. So. Um, if I could just mention, in case you didn't read the headlines yesterday, today, the legislature is is creating a new committee. Uh, scanning committee on housing, on affordable housing in particular. Um, I have been talking to Mo Terry and um, a couple of other legislators about it because of main, my sure. main municipal role. So I'll stay on top of that for you guys and repeat it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I have a bit, I'm a little wary, to be honest with you, about what are they going to come up with? And are they going to say, well, you can't have, you know, girls' ordinances anymore or or whatever? So just stay tuned on that. So, so that was one of the proposals last mm -hmm. week to eliminate exactly. the ordinances. And, and it got taken out at the end. But, you know, these questions help to identify. It is a useful tool. Yes. For example, we have some zones that are very flexible and liberal with their allowances without some sort of mechanism in there. You might have somebody come in and put a thousand units, you know, a thousand mm -hmm. units apartment complex or something like that. And that's not really what we're driving for. We want mixed use, we want flexible right. interest in um, cores in our community. So the GMO, by helping to restrict the scale or, or creating some doors, but you have to go through the door deliberately, um, but it does help you drive the type of development that I think we're trying to get out of the complex. And so you've got infrastructure. Issues too. I mean, how so how much water support. and sewer and and street. you know streets and uh, all of that is involved. Then if we have this explosive growth, there's no way to provide the infrastructure support. So keep in keep in mind that uh, design standards uh, are also a a, yeah. a, a a way to manage growth. Yeah. Uh, instead of saying um, that. 85% of the land can be built on, uh, and the uh, house can go up four stories. 
um, say 80% of the land can be built on. So you're saving more land and allowing fewer homes or fewer apartment buildings to be built on that. So consider how you how you use the land and the design standards as part of managing growth. Well, I think this is where kind of the mixed use um, concept kind of comes in as well. That has two purposes. Number one, it offers walkable amenities for multifamily housing structures. But the other thing it does is it takes a, a, a floor out of a four-story building and makes it into um, a commercial space, a commercial tax space, rather than a floor of units. So if we think about how mixed use design standards or or um, uh, adjustments to things like um, uh, 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 fees or uh, or permitting requirements or things like that to encourage mixed use that ha has a can have a pretty important role as well. So with that, should um, defined mixed use really making sure we define it? Should yeah. residential units in a mixed use structure be exempt? I mean. Would you go so far as to say that might be a good idea? And I think to your point, John, this is a tool that we have, but if we're really smart and forward thinking, we're thinking, ooh, state might take this away. Let's take everything else we've learned and let's catch up with all of our other ordinances. So if this goes away, yeah. we're ready right. with things like commercial design standards and setbacks yeah. and zoning changes yeah. and yeah. affordable housing requirements. You know, it's a lot of work, but getting- Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, um, employment, but I, yeah, yeah. good, Eric. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's kind of what I'm looking at this. Right. That's in the back of my mind. Okay, we have this tool that helps us, but if we didn't, let's right. get there. So if this goes away, it's a seamless transition. Yeah, oh, no. And it's not a, oh gosh, we're going to be inundated with a thousand units. They're, they're coming because I don't want this place to be like Texas where it just right. Comes, right? And that's so, where that nomenclature, I think, yeah. is, is helpful for us to. Because I think people think that we called it the GLO, mm -hmm. so that's the only thing that only thing growth. Like in fact, it's the it's a really small part of right. managing growth. It's a good tool, mm -hmm. but it's not the only tool in our portfolio. So this that's why I think this is really going to be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So to that question, is that a consideration? Is that something that I, I you know think, should I think the way that we play a part in that the, the way we, we've got it right now um, up to 289 mixed use in the crossroads plan development creates two problems. Number one, mm -hmm. the mixed, mixed use is one of the uh, if you look at sort of the, the verbiage of the comp plan, it's really encouraged by the comp plan. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's in Oak Hill, whether it's in Dunstan, whether it's in the crossroads, wherever, it's encouraged throughout that one growth um, um, growth area. Um, so number one, it kind of makes mixed use in other areas kind of disadvantaged rather than the crossroads. Right. Um, and it also kind of focuses attention among town voters mm -hmm. on the crossroads in a way which might not be helpful to the, the council. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I would, I, I like the idea of exempting mixed use, um, maybe mixed use in the growth corridor or mixed use in um, the targeted development or growth areas that we've okay. been highlighted or something like that. But I, I think that is part and parcel of the of, of the comp plan really so agreed and i think you'll find too uh part of this we're going through the different zoning districts and actually finding out you know where you can do the things that yeah. we want and squaring that up um so and and this last bullet the the crossroads i think i mean i don't want to speak for council but i think this is probably something that's not going to maybe be its own mm -hmm. thing moving forward this is kind of like we got to fix this and then move on and fix the whole picture right I'm, this is sort of yeah so hopefully it won't be so explicit and i do think that sometimes can give a negative connotation or kind of just bring attention to something but yeah mixed use and oak hill or mixed use anywhere on route one redeveloping a, yeah. or, would be a positive thing i think the way the comp plans are so yeah. um what about workforce housing <laughs> There's only ten, right? So you can only do ten. Um, that was a poor. That, that was a poor. I'm the one who put that in. Yeah. Was that your compromise? Did you yes. want more? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, it's long. Okay. Long. <laughs> but yeah, I'm the one that put in the ten workforce housing. Thinking, I was thinking in terms of single family housing at the time. Okay. In which that was done. Um, and then, of course, the market changed by like, boom. Sure. Um, and the market's still crazy, regardless of uh, rates and whatever, at mm -hmm. least around here. Um, so 
That was my intent. Okay. The so, legislator did. But it's not really defined as single housing, though it could be 10 units. I don't remember how it's for I think it might be. I think it is. I think it actually is like single family. I think the GMO is like little holes. Yeah. 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 Is yeah. that still. Oh, yeah. Is that still a a good intention, or would you like to see that change? So more different, you know, like workforce housing, more no matter what it is. Um, yeah, well, we since we did this edition of the GMO, we changed, we introduced the workforce housing definition mm -hmm. of zoning ordinance. Great, and mm -hmm. I, I view it as comparable to affordable. Maybe it's not mm -hmm. a blanket exemption, but um, you know. Certainly, you should be given some credence. Yes, okay. you do want more workforce. Okay. And again, you're going to see the state pushing that to sure. time because of the economic development issues around that. Right. Okay. So, a higher, yeah, not, at, at a minimum, a higher level, not maybe consistent with our zoning. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. And then, what about the one bedroom multi family unit exemption? Is this something that maybe should continue? Uh, do you see the value in that, or is it kind of tricky to look around? <laughs> what do you think? I think there's value in that, yeah. It's a smaller load on the town I mean, with a one bedroom unit as far as the families go. And so I think it's valuable to the upcoming mm -hmm. workforce housing or um, workforce. <clears throat> well, I'd be I'd be interested in knowing from the developers if we can get that information who is occupying those one bedrooms. Is it workforce or is it older people? What's going on with the and we're gonna have a session. Not that it matter, yeah. but I mean yeah. I'm just curious. Is uh, a certain we do level. plan on having a session with, with the development okay. community on this All as right. well, asking the same types of questions. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. Yeah. On a certain level though, that you Raise a good issue. There's we have nothing in here about um, uh, elderly housing or, or targeted elderly housing for people who want to age in place in, in, in town. Um, and this kind of helps that target uh, or right. helps that, that objective of allowing people to live a full lifetime in Scarborough, mm -hmm. um, even at a point where they don't need a three bedroom house anymore. Um, so um, I think this serves multiple objectives. Um, so if we didn't have this, or if we thought we should sunset this, we might want to have something in there about um, targeted elder care um, uh, development or target or or an exemption for elder care units. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other than in the affordable blanket, maybe just yeah. Okay. So this one uh, for some of the moderate sized developments that come to town. Uh, they need some assurance that they're going to be able to get permits, mm -hmm. build the units before right. they commit to doing the design work and going through it. And 29 units a year is a relatively small apartment development. Uh, so this was put in there to have a mechanism that spans years so that they could, with confidence at least, uh, try to set out a project. Uh, the other reason for the one bedroom, I initially tried to get one and two bedrooms exempt. Was because of cost to serve. There's, uh, it's dramatically different between one bedroom and three bedrooms and mm -hmm. single family homes. Yeah. Um, that I, I couldn't find a basis or a reason uh, to restrict those units in the same way. But the fractionalization of those before, I mean, we addressed that. Through, it. And, and, and now it went away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're going to find another way around that. that that's all. Yeah. That, well, we were trying to find another way to accomplish this. Okay. okay. And I think that brings us back to number three. So the annual allocation that John just mentioned, the limit. Um, so when you have that larger scale development that comes in, you know, maybe there's 300 units. And right now we have um, uh, the AR apartments, so it's 120 units, 60 units or one bedroom, 60 or two bedrooms. So they're gonna use up 60 of our one bedroom uh, exemptions, and then they'll use up 60 growth permits for this one apartment complex. And so that's a pretty substantial drain on this number for one apartment complex in an area that's targeted growth. It's where we want it. Um, we like it. So it leaves, it begs the question of, um, and the way the ordinance is written now, and I, I forget who brought it up, but it was a great point. So they get to do that. But then later in the year, we get this amazing project that comes in, right? And they are offering a lot more, but they have to go through the exemption process. 
and they may be a better project to begin with. But because of timing and the way this annual allocation works, they have to go through a much more rigorous process. And so um, the, the person, the committee member, is like, shouldn't everybody have to go through the same process? And again, I think that ties back to the ordinances being in place really to say what you want and still having maybe the exemption process, but perhaps it's a bit different. So it's not, it seems unfair almost um, from, from that perspective. Yeah, from the planning board's perspective, I, I sometimes feel as though we're engaging in bait and switch. <laughs> um, yes, we've just approved your project. You've, you've gone through all of the hoops. This is wonderful, good architecture, uh, good landscaping. Every, you just gave uh, X number of acres to the land trust. This is, this is great. Lots of luck getting permission now uh, and dumped into this whole process. And from the council perspective, it's the opposite. We're we're trying to make a decision on a project before it's gone through any of those um, you know protocols where you've added your value to it. Right. Because the exemption process goes through the first. Yeah. Process. So it's a it's a very um pretty hard way to manage it, I think. Um so with that, does this total permit number every year, you know, for the long range planning committee, does that mean something? Is it important that we have that cap? Um, I think part of the purpose of an annual cap of any sort, regardless of the number, is to allow for infrastructure to not get ahead of itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, th there will be improvements that have to be made to some roads. There will be um, additional capacity from the, the water the water district or from the sewer district. There's, there's those things um, can't flex as quickly to an individual developer's need as maybe we would like them to. So I think there's still there's still something in the annual allocation process that expresses just the the um, the hard fact that building infrastructure and enhancing infrastructure takes time. Um, so I, 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 there's always going to be sort of an arbitrary nature of what period you choose over which to limit. Um, and there's not a real way around that arbitrary fact, but it does strike me that some sort of a time-oriented progressive cap makes sense because of the nature of, of that. Now, you can think of other mechanisms. Say you have a five-year limit, and within that five-year limit, on any given year, you can have up to 25 or 30 percent of the, of the, of the five-year limit allocated. So that if you have a good project come along, okay, you're going to consume future years' growth permits. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you, so you can think of different mechanisms. But I think at some point you do need if, we're, if this is a rate of growth maintenance or management ordinance. Rate implies time, and right. and yeah, so there's going to be something like that. They should get it backwards though. I don't think the infrastructure is going to get ahead of the no, 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 no. It, 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 the correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we actually had a program that allowed that in the past that we've eliminated. All right. I, and I forget what it was called, but I knew that there was a, I'll call it a bucket of a pool that people could actually, you know, say, I'd like to take, I want to build this and we remove it from the hole. And there yeah. was no time limit on that in terms of it expired in five years or whatever. Yeah. It just and then the council could replenish it. Yeah. Right. And, and then every now and then the council would and add the, more and back. It's based on it's so we we yeah. had that. And and now we said, okay, we don't want to do that. And 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 I have a question I want to ask the council members, but maybe I shouldn't. Um you can ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They can just I mean, shuffle. How how much of this, um, I'll call it rate of growth. How much was that driven by the public saying slow down mm -hmm. in 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 our town? I mean, who's really driving the need to slow everything down? Um, well, that was back. So the issue was gone. The concern was a combination of pressure on the school right yep. uh, pressure on fire and services part of it came out of the um, growth and services committee where we concluded that 
residential development was much more expensive for a town to deal with than commercial. Remember that? We had there was a negative number yeah. of taxes <coughs> that this you know, first iteration of this, if I recall, was a way for the town to help slow residential growth because of the impact of our school generally. Yeah, it, it, safety. It, and it's you know, it's obviously could, could be my imagination, change. but it, it feels like we've done one of these. Yep. Okay. Because yeah, we had that kind of driving the process. Then all of a sudden, we kind of went, "Whoa, whoops!" Just let it flow. So that was and back in two thousand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and there was a building boom at the time. Yeah. The ordinance really didn't do anything for twenty years. It didn't come into play. We never. Ran out of never hit anything. Never it may have implicitly it like affected things, but it um, the market change. It was pretty well done too. I, I there's a lot of good points to try to organize, but I want to say. But then what happened in, in 2021 is we ran out of permits. We ran out of permits in January. And as a counselor, from my perspective, we, we essentially had a moratorium in yeah. place. And you're supposed to resolve moratoriums within six months. And we looked at the ordinance. And then it became political. So, yeah. uh, who was on the council at the time that didn't like fractionalization, uh, didn't like the reserve pool, wanted more authority with the right. council, deliberate action. So, that's the flavor it took when we did it in a hurry. Yep. Um, that allowed some of it that, that cured the moratorium for that year. And, and that's where we are. We've lived with it year after it, uh, which was this year, and learned some things through that. And now we're going to try to. Uh, Get back to something that I would call we went through six or eight years ago. We went through an exercise where it, it peaked out, and there were there was a table that was put out of all the houses with sticks in the fire in terms of residential units right. that were on the books. I don't think half of them went through in right. the end, but it was still there was a very strong. I remember meeting in this room with some of the developers about that, yeah. uh, trying to resolve uh, a revision to the GMO, and I think it was six or eight years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the pressure has always been there, and I think we dodged it up until last year. Right. So, it's but, always been there. Yeah. If, yeah. If, I think so, you're right. That's the question of why do you want to regulate the number of permits? If it's fiscal issues, which is why across the country, a lot of growth management or rate of growth ordinances are put out there. If it's, you know, sort of the zeitgeist of the community feeling like, we're growing too fast, or what are those? What are those reasons? The real reasons why you want to uh, regulate the rate of growth, um, and so that's, you know, really I think what the council needs to hear. What? Why are we doing this to begin with? Um, and I would say some conditions have changed over, you know, since two thousand. And this is a simple explanation, but like if you're looking at school enrollment. Our units have shot up, but our school enrollment has gone down. So I don't think you can blame new growth directly for um, changes in the cost of school. What that is, is a change in the cost per yeah, we, Yes. Well, it's also an increase in cost per student. Right. So it's not the number of students that drove up the cost. It's other things that... So it doesn't state affect requirements. Yeah. For yeah. So you kind of have to move school out of that equation of why you want to regulate growth. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, there may be some other growth related issues, but certainly the just on the face, just straight flush of number of students, number of new units, that, you know, the, the lines are going like this. On the other hand, if you build a lot of elder care units, and there's migration of people from three bedroom houses to elder care, mm -hmm. you've got now potential for a school explosion that's not tied to growth or to actual new sticks in the ground, but it is tied to housing. housing. And that's what is incredible in right. my neighborhood right now. Yeah. It's turned over in the last two right. years. Where are you? In, in uh, Windward Town, Chemical Mill. Yes, Southern. yes. Mm -hmm. yep. And that is, you know, yeah. we know that it, I mean, it's not like both the record, but we know that that ten percent of our population turns over every year. Right. Like, so we've got two thousand new residents, and it has nothing to do with the new units. Right. It's just 
that turnover yeah. and with that turnover looking at the ups and downs of the demographics and you've got some demographic changes going yep. on too because the uh pop I'm one of those boomers, so I'm going to move for a lot. <laughs> but, you know, when you get into the millennials, the Gen Z, and whatever the heck they're calling them coming down, I mean, I my daughter's a millennial, and a good number of her friends, she's 31. Okay, so they may be starting families, but they only want one kid, if any. You know, it's very interesting watching some of the demographic trends going on. Um, not to say that we wouldn't have a lot of people with kids because as a real estate broker, I know people would love to live in Scarborough with a school system, but they can't afford it. And so there you go. Yeah. And so I just think we want to be, you know, as committees, we want to we want to say, like, what why do we why do we want to do this? And fiscal may not be the strongest argument. There may be more arguments with transportation or right. other types of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when a development comes along, what a developer is going to tell you, and what they're going to tell us loudly, I think, if we, when we have them together, is, but you're making us pay for infrastructure improvements. So why are you limiting us if we're paying right. that right. that debt? And I think that's always the question of, yeah. well, you know, are our tools the right, you know, have we charged the right amounts and those types of things? Right. But it's hard to get away from the developer saying, you're charging me for something, or you're, you're you don't want me to build, but I'm willing to pay for that. Yes, you're paying for the impact according to yeah. yeah. You're paying yeah. for on-site improvements. You're paying for off-site traffic improvements. You're plus impact fees. Plus cool. impact fees. <laughs> plus your fault. If you're following our zoning ordinance, what that tells me, looking out, looking in, is that we don't like what we have in place, and we're uncomfortable with. So <laughs> we use this tool as a stop measure. It's like a fail-safe, right? And so. Like, to, if we didn't have this magic number, what would happen? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. And, and, and that's where I get to, we got our comp plan. What the elements of our comp plan that we got missing right now is really the the implementation of the, the mixed use concept, which, is, which we right. uh, applaud, and those design standards that we want to enforce to make sure the community grows in a, in, in a, in a way that pleases everyone. Right. And, and those gaps are not about the GMO. Those are the GMO surveys taking up the time that we would have used to talk about them. Yeah, <laughs> I have two meetings in January. <laughs> two years. Yeah. Right, right. So yeah. the interesting thing to me is that I think our comp plan, comp plan the way it's structured, mm -hmm. it's actually prompting growth, mm -hmm. which to me, and I'm putting on my transportation committee kind of thing <laughs> here now, is if we actually followed it, and didn't necessarily limit it. We're going to build what we need for our town infrastructure that will actually allow us to try to resolve some of our transportation uh, transportation issues because it's going to give us the, the 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 bulk that we need in order to make stuff like mass transit work. Where right now we're very concerned about the quantity of transportation issues that we have, but we're not allowing ourselves to resolve them because we can't get the mask for the solution. So it's kind of like, uh, what do you want to fix? System, uh, systems approach to things is very complicated and hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yep. We really need the annual cap. Pardon me? So we really need oh, the annual cap. Today? Mm -hmm. I have, I have a related question. Can I throw it in here? And that is uh, growth management begs the question of what's the growth target? And I've been somewhat involved for the last couple of years uh, in thinking about things and participating in them. I don't know what our growth target is. Uh, population, let's just use that as a target. Uh, number and anyway, that's it. Do we have one? What is it? And is I, it I think, relevant? I think there are legal issues with trying to it manage is. population, but our growth target is your company. The business outline there is what you're trying to achieve. Well, and I, I'm implicitly, it might be there. I'm, I'm at, 
You mean they're legal issues if you say yes. they want to? Right. In 10 years, yeah, we want to have yeah, the, 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 the whole GMO is statutorily permitted. I don't have to that carefully. You can't just say, yeah, we've decided we don't want more than what we call the building. Right. Well, that, uh, my question is, is 10 years from now, do we want a population? I think we ever really focused on that. Yeah. I don't think we yeah. can. And, and I think, as, as I read the component too, it's, it's not that we're targeting any number, but if if we grew to 32,000 people, say, yeah, um, yeah, here's, exactly, here's what you got to do. You've got to have a lot more commercial development because we need to keep that balance of commercial tax base and residential tax base, or else those 32,000 people are going to pay much, much higher um, uh, residential tax assessments. So we've got to keep that balance. And if that means in order to encourage the commercial development, we'll never hit, hit, hit 32,000. Okay, I guess that's kind of how the number right. bounce out. That so, seems long range to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. And, and I think that's the missing piece, at least as I'm understanding it. I may not be understanding it. But that's My question on whether we need the Yankee Capital Park or your, what I thought you said earlier mm -hmm. is do we do this on a project by project basis rather than first come first serve it? Which is what I understand to be found. I don't think we could do it. I don't think the planning board could say, okay, you're approved and you're allowed to have 20 permits per year. If if the if the objective is to spread out, <clears throat> why not leave in the 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 cap per per project indirectly, but eliminate the annual cap, particularly if we rarely exceed it. But I mean, I guess I'm I'm trying to figure out. What are we trying to do here? <laughs> do we say is it not working well? Is there an unfairness aspect? If I'm yeah. ready to start building in October, and sorry, we we hit our 144. Do you have to line up next year? There's a fairness issue here, I think, yeah. in part. I mean, the irony of all this is that the old tool was bigger lot, you know, two acre minimum. That will reduce the number of homes. And then we all smartened up and said, wait a minute, we're gobbling up all this land. Right. Oh, and the let's, out and the let's, cost. let's, and then we ended up with like the project down on the one that's very end of the whatever. Smaller, tiny thing, compact, or, you know, great American city, the great American. Oh, well, yeah. But then, yeah. of course, then yeah. it started. The, but I guess I'm, I'm, I've always wondered 144. Is it arbitrary based on anything? There's a state, state there's a state yeah. law yeah. Yeah. that yeah. drives what that number yeah. there's a, a minimum, minimum number yeah. have at least that's driven by that. And I, I want to say two years right. ago that number was something like 134. So yeah. it's yeah. gone so up a little bit, it's but five percent right. every two years when you reevaluate yeah. it. Yeah. So up again. Well, my problem is eliminating the Maybe tighten up the rest of it so that every project is entitled to get some permits each year if they're ready to go. But we say the max that any one project can get is X per year. But I think we're hearing that that maximum is a problem for a larger. That's why I would limit that. Oh, not the max in 144, the 20% max. We're hearing that that. So if they knew they could build it in five years, they probably but you think could that get around it, but they might not want it. Right, right. Because you different sort of developers, un, un, Maine doesn't have them yet, right? Yeah. So we don't have your production builder <laughs> until yet. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not here to help you get them. Yeah. I'm just going to put that out there. Texas is production builders. I mean, right. you go, oh, yeah. you leave on Friday, Monday, there's 10 more framed up and they can't work on Sunday. So it's crazy. Yeah. Those are production builders. And once you start getting that pressure, their time frames are 12 to 18, you know, and right. they won't work within this. So you're saving yourself from that a little bit with this percentage. Right. Um, so just say, just, just, it's all like, you know, figuring out yeah. what you want. But then some of those might be really good projects and you might get a big benefit out of them. Maybe they're located in a part of town where you really want to take care of some conservation land. And right. so there's some benefits. And to your point, maybe they are evaluated on those benefits rather than maybe there's not a fix for 
uh, one size fits all sort of fix, but they're really evaluated. But then that becomes hard at council because the exemption process has proven that that's tricky, right? Because we don't have all this public benefit to find. So we might be right. It's a vicious cycle. Yeah, and it's circular because, yeah. um, in theory, if they're doing what's allowed and in fact required by ordinance, there's mm -hmm. public benefit and puts it with that. Now we're saying, well, put some gravy on top. Right. right. And maybe we'll let you do it. Yeah. Right. Right. So the original, when we had the pool, and remind me, I believe, Alan, you would know this as, as well, because I think you kind of dealt with it more when you were planning board chair. The um, the planning board had to approve access to the pool. I mean, the council controlled the number of permits in the pool, but I thought the planning board, as somebody went through the project, they said, yeah, you meet the requirements for dipping into the pool. The planning board did not have a say in that. So okay. the only the only restriction I feel that the planning board had when I was on it okay. was that if the developer met the ordinances, you had to approve it. Right, right. You couldn't not approve it. The only in, in nine years, we disapproved two projects. One and the only one that was I thought was I'll call it different or unique was they wanted to put in a Dunkin' Donuts just as you're coming into Dunstan heading southbound. Oh, right. And we we decided that that was a traffic safety issue, and we denied it on a safety issue. And that's the really the only project we ever really denied in nine years because the developer working with right. the planning board. Now, they might have had to come back six or seven times instead of three. But over that time frame, we worked through those issues and got them to meet the ordinance. And what they did, once they did, you had to approve it. Right. And that's some people walk away, you know, just say, well, I don't want to do that time. Right. So they've withdrawn, but they didn't get denied. Right. So, yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's current. As long as I've been on the board, I don't think we've we haven't disapproved anything, although some folks have decided not to come back. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, because your personal opinion doesn't matter on the planning board or shouldn't. You can't deny because you don't like the project. So, this is actually a, so a, a wrinkle with the town council now. exemption process that yeah. um, caught us this year. So, as a planning board, you're quasi judicial. You're evaluating a project based on the facts of compliance. We were actually put ourselves in that position the way the council exemption process works. Um, but we didn't follow the basic rules that you typically follow with that, right? You're supposed to be impartial and it's not supposed to be a political decision that they right. evaluate the project. Um, so that was a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me. It's, and I'm glad we got out of it with a bunch of lawsuits, uh, but it, uh, that could be better. I have another question. We're talking about a quantity here, right? Um, where is quality a consideration? Well, that goes to the point of is quantity such a big thing if quality is defined, yeah. right? So if you know what quality you're going to get, is the is the number important anymore? So I quality think is through the zoning ordinance. through the zoning ordinance and through the work that this group is yeah, going to do yeah, and, and that's to yeah, that, amend things and alter. Well, is we're, isn't it interrelated though? It is, but it's not. Um, you can't do quality with the growth management tool. It's one tool, right? And then so the quality comes in with your zoning ordinance and your site plan ordinance and your commercial standards. So they're all tools. Comp plan big and then these little things feed together and quality and, quality can't be a part of uh, the gmo it could for be legal reasons or well it's just not the same thing the it's growth, a rate of growth it's ordinance. a rate of growth ordinance yeah. and so it is assuming that your quality is defined over here and it all works together it's, but, it's, but quality is for commercial objective. design to my knowledge it doesn't apply to residential Except in the T and D, there's some different little things, but yeah, you do have. You can also think of quality as your setbacks and your impervious yeah. cover and okay. your yep. 
materials and things like that for single family. Well, so it's not, it's not just it's like, it's not just, yeah. Yeah. What you have yeah. Is there a way of sure. linking quality to the GMO in a more defined way? I think you could use it as in the public, if you cut the exemption process and you define the public benefit yeah. uh, process, kind well, of I, thing. Or if you define your standards, like, yeah. like yeah. your, your design standards and you say, some, a project that meets these design standards will call much. Yeah, so I mean, it wouldn't be a question, really, Marvin. I think that's the point. Like, if someone came in, residential developer, and they meet all of our quality standards, the, and then they would just move on to getting a permit. It's not, it's not totally linked in a, a package, but it is really on the way the process works. So you have to first go through site plan and do all those quality things before you can be considered for that number. And, and again, is there a way of linking that to the GMO at all? I mean, no is a good answer. I don't, I think the state or, the state ordinance, which allows this, gives a community the power to uh, do different levels of permits in different, area, different areas to support the, you know, your growth areas. I don't know that it, it that, that it allows you to, with every permit, assign a quality or mm -hmm. something like that. But it's a, it's a, it, it may be a legal question. It's the, so the it specifically defines um, geographic areas. It doesn't define anything else, and so that's the question. But, but I guess not. specifically, it, it does feel like the the growth, uh, the GMO, um, is really about certain zoning areas um the r2 district the rf and rfm districts um uh, uh, if we removed the gmo cap from the designated growth districts or even just some of the the, the tvc2 tvc districts um, um in the center there that's really where the bigger projects want to go anyway um you know and we don't want the bigger projects going in the r2 district so it strikes me that, that you could take a look at our zoning map and the, the, the colors that I can't distinguish because I'm colorblind that go down the middle of Route one. Um, there are those, there are quite a, uh, there are a number of zones there that we would say, okay, there's not a cap here, um, but there is a 144 um, uh, unit cap for the town in general for all those other areas and we'll give you an exemption for affordable housing and gift lots and whatever it might be. So, um, Maybe we focus on the the zoning map and what the zoning map um, kind of. And you told us this in the last couple of meetings on that, that our zoning map looks pretty good. It kind of maps to what we said in our comp plan is what the shape of the town we're looking for. So maybe we just use that zoning map as a exemption. Our, our GMO um, uh, cap it lives here. GMO cap doesn't live here because this is where we're focusing our growth. It's the issue people are drawing too many permits. I mean, I guess I'm I'm trying to figure out if, if people are drawing permits <clears throat> because they're afraid that it's going to get capped, so they'll draw permits but then not build. We're not seeing that right okay. now. I, I think I think that happened earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So happens first start uh, two years ago. There was a run on permits. There was a run on permits. Okay, okay. I, I think it's going to change. Find out if that's somehow yeah. driving some of this. But now one of the things the council did is it tied. You can't get your growth management permit until you're ready. Which is a hindrance a bit because if you go through the site planning process and that's an expensive lengthy entitlement yeah. process, right? And you get planning board says, yes, you shall go forward. And then they come to my office and say, we say, no, there's no <laughs> permit for you. Have a great day. Sorry, you just spent 150 grand. Yeah. Right. Come back next year. Right. Okay. And so that's, you know, what we're we're hearing is a problem as well, too. And I think that's a legitimate problem from a development perspective is knowing when you get the entitlement um, and when when you're good to go yeah. and for financing. And you got to put a shovel in the board. ground, sure. I think, within six months after yeah. you get yeah. the yeah. only permission. Yeah. So, right. yeah. 31, you can do, extension. you have one year for your site plan and then we can right. do an extension. So. But yeah, I mean, does that work? The market changes so much within 12 to 18 months. I mean, we see that from six months. months. <laughs> <laughs> if I look at permits, mm -hmm. it tends to follow the economic cycle. Not yeah, anything we're sure. doing. It's following interest rates. That's correct. So yeah. outside of crossroads, 
I don't have these concerns. I think the zoning is pretty good and would you know, it probably would take care of itself. I actually think one of the only reasons we need the DMO is because Crossroads is so liberal. You can basically go build whatever you want. And mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, but if you can cure that, then I don't know that there's a huge need for benefit from the rest of the DMO. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's to be honest with you, John, that's kind of why I'm hearing in this discussion as well. The GMO is is solving a bunch of problems that don't exist in most of the town, except for here. Right. Um, and and that strikes me then, okay, this is this is the wrong tool for the project. Um, you know, this we, we need some other we need some other um tool in the toolkit. So and John, if if my memory serves me right, one of the reasons why the ordinance for the Downs property opened up in terms of what was allowable to be built was that there was a fear that there was going to be this massive total residential single yes, family home exactly. coming into 500 acres and yep. just swamping the other services of the town. Exactly so we decided if I think we decided as a board, at least that's what I'm remembering, that if we opened it up to different uses, that we could get something more right. of the downtown area that people are trying to work on now or there and eliminated the massive amount of single family homes. Okay. So I think that's the reason why that yes. zone ultimately got opened up. Is that what you remember, Rick? Or it was something like that. I remember, it was similar. I remember you got the CEA tip process in there too that said you can't do this and do that. Yeah. And that's, so, it, and that's the thing. Then the, 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 a unit cap or a, 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 a unit cap for single family residential for that region for that area makes sense and then but no cap for mixed use also makes sense because the mixed use builds the downtown road well, or if, right yeah it's it's a, it's a, it's a a single family because yeah. the credit enhancement agreement limits the number of single families yes right. so you know and then i think one question too talk about design standards and other things it's like if you if you look at the assessor's definition of Multi of multi-family units with five units per structure. That's a commercial structure. Yes, it is. So, do we treat the multi-family as commercial? Oh, well, the yeah, larger they have to have their own design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I don't want to mix it that way. I don't. That yeah. commercial. Yeah. Is, we can just treat it as what it is. Yeah. I think. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> well, unless to not the, complicate it, right? Yeah. But unless the commercial definition right. gives you more flexibility yeah. for the design standards and other things, then it could be worth treating them as commercial. Right. We definitely will treat them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to make sure we see them. For, yeah, you know, good. But John, to back to what you said, what are you worried about the downs? What are you worried about them? I mean, I don't want me to put you on the spot. I'm just asking. I get along with, uh, um, with them, but because it's business. And so I think the, the design of the zoning was uh, ahead of its time. It was, you had a huge plot of land in the mm -hmm. middle of your town, and you wanted to encourage rational, reasonable development on it and entice somebody to buy it, basically. It right. took a long time. Mm -hmm. um, some did, and they're local. And, uh, but they have uh, pressures that we don't necessarily empathize with mm -hmm. where they need to. They need to make a profit or a return on that investment. And they have core competencies that they know how to do that. And they have some other things that we want to happen there that they're not as familiar with. Right, yeah. So, uh, you know, left to their own devices, they it might not all be single family, but it might be, you know, 90% residential with yeah. commercial. Has the conversation ever come up with them? And this may not be the right place to have this question, but hey, Downs, we, we, Gave you this master plan, plan development sort of agreement. We didn't fully think it through and we were struggling with it. And you're, you know, you've been the the brunt of this GMO change midstream. Is it more reasonable to sit down with them and restructure that how the CPD is actually written? So we actually require the 10% instead of cumulative, it's per district. We make conservation deed restricted rather than open space. I mean, where we, we learn from our mistakes and address them, to Peter's point, we address the downs. The and and the but at this point. is yeah. it too yeah. far along? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. them understanding, then we're not gonna mess with their permits. We're not going to yeah. get in 
involved with how they pull permits. And they have their own planner. They might be open to that. I mean, I, I I'm just saying, like, plan. I feel like, you know, I, I'm old there. There. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just <laughs> wondered if that's ever know. come up as an opportunity to, because it really is about the way the zone is written, not where that's, that's what, and, and I've talked to Eric about that. I'm like, oh, okay, this, oh, I don't, I know why that was written that way, and I know why that was written that way, and it's it's great. It just wasn't maybe in the town's best interest, and it, that's what this GMO is trying to address. But at the same time, do we want to punish other folks yeah. that might do what we want to implement the prom plan? Right. Well, I think we try to influence them. I mean, every smart growth guideline in the world pushed towards a mixed use development mm -hmm. or right. a, a, a marsh wood or a, you know a, a, a numerous case studies out there that I think we all kind of have uh, you know looked at and kind of referred to as we pushed the down in a direction um, seeing it as an incredible opportunity for that to boost the town boost the commercial boost the residential um, and I you know it, it evolved um, and there are a lot of people that are involved on that side of the table that we all know in town who came up to government here as well. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and, you know, I think we did our best to influence them and uh, right. push it in a smart growth right. direction. John, you made an interesting point that, um, you know, the, 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 this isn't down the middle or what we borrow is traditional development, right? This is, oh, um, yeah. um, and mixed use development in Maine in general is kind of something that we're going to have to nurture. Yes. Um, um, if we if we want a mixed use centers within our town, we're gonna have to nurture developers who are willing to kind of make the step to building four story buildings with a, a pub and a convenience store on the first floor, um, which they don't normally do. Yeah. So right. um, Knightville did a good job with that. I thought I, I think they did. Um, although they had a lot of existing stock that they could take advantage of, they recycle. Yeah. Um, we're we're kind of building it from scratch here. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I think um, what strikes me about that though is that we can nurture that by allowing them to have, uh, allowing sort of um, unlimited within the master plan construct um, uh, pace of growth for mixed use. But you can only build so many single families per year. Um, and, 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 and then you're saying, you're gonna make money on your property. It's, it's, it's fully in your, um, uh, in your portfolio now decide how fast you want to develop the downtown with all the units up top and all the commercial rentable pro leasable property on the bottom. Um, but for the single family stuff that you've already built a lot of, we're going to slow, we're going to ask you to slow, uh, uh, pay, uh, get the brakes away. Um, and then the rest of the GMO is basically no more than 25 units of RF and RFM districts and 144 units um, of single family housing throughout the rest of town and the exemption if you're, about, if you're building affordable housing. It, 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 you slim the, the detail and complexity of the GMO way down by just having that conversation with the Downs. And, and my perception, and I, I, I talked to the Downs a bit when I was running last year, um, or still this year, actually, <laughs> back in June. Um, and and um, they want to move quickly. They would love to move quickly on single family, but they would love to move quickly. Because the longer they have land laying fallow, right. that's what their their biggest downside is. If they can build on the parts that are a bit outside their expertise or their historical expertise, et cetera, but at least they're building, um, I think they're gonna be pretty happy about that. You gotta see it to believe it though. No, but that's that, that but that you drive through as as I did again, the the papers the other day, there's their own way to be. Residential no. units. And, and You're right. Well, that, until you, at least for me, until you see something that, yeah. as far as mixed use goes. Well, that's why I say it's, it's, it's like all. It, that's why I say you, you 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 limit or you take away their ability to build more single family, but you give them full scope to develop as much mixed use as they want. But if they don't have do, one set of rules for them and another set of rules for the rest of the town, yeah, yeah. Or, we, they're they're in a separate zone. They're right? in a separate zone. Yeah. yeah. I, I I really think if this really comes down to a downs, I I think it's a it's a downs development plan issue, and it is not a play in the growth management. No, and then moving forward, we learn 
But as we do these plan developments, perhaps part of the plan development is the GMO doesn't affect them. So the growth, the rate of growth doesn't affect them because they're approved in this manner. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, if that's what it really gets down to, and that's what we're really struggling with trying to fix the big elephant in the room and the small little pieces over here, we can take care of the small pieces pretty easily. And our zoning district right. does a great job. And then we, we, focus instead of the numbers we focus on fixing those ordinances along the way in case the state takes it away but we're not in really right. a bad spot yeah right and then we fix the downs over here on this and then it's not a and and i totally agree marvin when you when you um write a mixed use ordinance or plan development there are parameters you yes. get 50 single family for this many square foot of commercial for this much square foot of multifamily. And that's those what's those meant. Were set, though. Those, those numbers are out there. Right? It's a, it's no, not a, it's no, a, not a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's the grand scheme yeah. is there, but the timing along the way. And that's what gives folks comfortability. Yeah. That's a word. When you see these things move forward, you're like, oh, I see the, the coffee right. shop and yeah. the bookstore. Right with the apartments and I see the people walking to it. Oh, this what this is this right. is cool. I wanna I wanna it's starting, it, it's starting to look like Maine because Maine looks like that in a lot of places. Right. I mean I love it where we are I've walked 15 miles in the last week. So I just go places because I can there's right. sidewalks and things to do. Um if we, if we do it right we'll look like Belfast. And you don't, don't and the only, it's pretty that's cool. The GMO is the only tool in the toolbox that I don't looking and seeing well, how it put the brakes on the downs this year uh, and you know put the council through the ringer mm -hmm. for the last year and a half or so so if what you're talking about structuring what the downs can do going forward can be tightened up mm -hmm. before anything's done with the gmo that's great but uh do that first sure I'm, sure um, and, and then make the changes to the GMO. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. If you could do that outside and separate the two issues, I think it would make good. I, I think I it makes life a lot easier. And it's, there's some, I, I, you know, I'm not speaking for the downs or anything, but I think there's some definite benefit to them knowing what is expected along the way and that it won't get changed. It might not be ideal for them, well, but economically, they should be building rental units now instead of. Um, ownership units. Sure, sure. So, and I think that's where they want to go. And I think is right. and I, they just turned in their master plan for the downtown. And I think their intentions are well set. I mean, yeah. I think it's a great project. I don't want to, you know, I just think it's not structured in a way that made the town feel comfortable. <laughs> the whole, the way it's written, and the expectations along the way. And but I, I really feel positive that that could be addressed in that light. And Maybe this whole exercise gets us back to the comp plan and implementing yeah, I, that. What, I don't know. What, what do you think the feel of the council would be if you tried to pull the downs out of the whole GMO process, thought process? If they're handled separately? Yeah. My input, I think there would be general support for that. I think so too. You know, the way Autumn's talking about doing it, where it's more explicit is, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think we could get support for doing that. Uh, if it made sense. Mm -hmm. Plan yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think we might know what we want now, right? right? And what right. they're thinking is yeah. what we're to yeah. or it's just, So I think we're close to being able to do that without there being too many um, mm -hmm. confrontation points. Could be could be an interesting play. I still think the GMO gives you uh, what you need, and it gives you the muscle. In order to get what you want yes. out of it, because this has not been a. Well, Marvin, maybe one way to look at it is um, they've been, right. Right. yeah, they, they've been hitting a uh, hit with a bat before of um, uh, uh, the GMO, so they know it's out there. Mm -hmm. And if we're effectively our our quid pro quo is you're going to build this downtown and see if it's in a good way, or else the bat, we're back, yeah. back there. Yeah, <laughs> we're ready to go. We know how to use it. We don't want to, but. Um, that that to me, we, we actually have some negotiating leverage as a result of the the, the pain they felt on the GMO. So if you change the GMO first agree, so. before you address this, I think you lose the. Oh, like, yeah, you yeah. lose yeah. the yeah. Yeah. So you, you got to go after this yeah. first, and then yeah. then yeah. play with the GMO. Yeah. yeah. So where I'm like, I don't know what this looks like, right? From a planner's perspective, mm -hmm. we we didn't have it. 
<laughs> I know. <laughs> my love mixed use. I'm, you know, I'm 10, 15 years ago, I wrote my first mixed use order. Right. Stuff. So I, I think, you know, and there's, it's pretty, it's not bad. There's just a few things to tighten up and to yeah. get clarity on. And I think Dan would understand that and be willing to definitely oh, I work. I don't think you're, I think you might be surprised at the yeah. idea. Like, oh, we can do this outside of this. Right. And then I, I think you might be really surprised with that, how positive that might work. I think you then have a different conversation with developers outside the downtown. Sure. Yeah. In the growth areas, it's like, okay, here's Definitely. the parameters that we're looking for for growth in those right. areas. Give us projects that they get out of sense. Go for it. Yeah. We're bumping up against 925. Do we need to save time for any other items? I, I put it on there, but I knew we weren't going to get here. <laughs> do we have people still in on? I was going to say, do we need public comment? Let's see if we have anybody. I know we have. Oh, we finished one. though with it. I was just asking if yeah, we done time. with uh, yes, I think we have. Uh, Which is good because I have. I don't have any hands up. I just have Karen and Rachel. Oh, yeah. It did work. It did work. <laughs> <You> work. <laughs> So no public comment. Um, any staff update comes around? The only update I have really, I've passed out a calendar for you for next year. Thank you. Uh, one thought we, on, on that one, you got September 1st, which is the Friday before the Labor Day. Oh. That's probably a bad day for no. a lot of people. Okay. So whatever, September 8th, I think is usually a better day. It's September 8th. Okay. Yeah. We'll look at that one. And I, we're going to try to have all the meetings in here. I think this is a little bit more intimate yeah, space. This, yeah, having, I mean, the, the public so safety is nice, but it's so big and we're kind of yelling. Right. And they're um, there's a couple of months that I couldn't skip this room. I'm going to still try, but right now we're in town managers, but we'll probably be able to get something else in yeah. March and April too. So uh, other than that, we have um we'll do commercial design standards, I promise, next month. <laughs> and I hope you all have a very merry holiday. We'll do that next month too. We're really close on that one. It's really small. Um I told Brian I would text them if we needed him. I didn't think we I didn't think we'd get there. This has been a really, really positive, yeah. great discussion. Great. Great. I'm really excited about all just going through the boards and committees with all of these questions and this discussion has been really positive, I think. It looks as though the question eight Oh, that's a great overarching overarching principles guiding. And I think I would just say follow the comp plan. Yeah, follow the comp plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we spent two years building the comp plan. I mean, I think that's really ultimately. <laughs> we started in 16. And that's true, yeah. I will also, um, we had a link created so you could do this on like a survey type yeah. dot form. And I'll send this out to you all. Yeah, and so you can personally think. Think about it as well, and you can submit it back, and then I'll try to put everybody. So we'll each individually so each... do this, and then the board will have a consolidated one. Cool. Is that the... if you want to individually add something, you don't have to answer all of the yeah. questions. Yeah. But if there's a point you want to make, and then I'll put them all together and disperse it and say, yeah, you're nice. Um, the idea is to have one consolidated okay. um, for the committee. For the committee. Um, sure. But if somebody has a great thought that comes up, like, oh, I really think we should have. 24 workforce units. Right. You exactly. know, and we'll put that in and then I'll. question they're generated by uh, Nick and John. Yes. Or, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you. I've been, I've served on this LRPC since I arrived on the council in 2013. I will not miss eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's not my fourth day, but um, I'll. I'm still on the ordinance, so I'll be watching what comes through. And if any of you have anything you ever want to reach out to me about, you know where to find me. You guys have a really strong advocate on the ones. Thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. So, following on that, do we have a liaison? John, you okay? Well, in April, in April, yeah. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah, you. Yeah. you need to adjourn. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we'll uh, we'll get another. <laughs> you and Anne get another. Uh, you and uh, Rick get another shot. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I knew that. Yeah.
got, you've got three cracks at the, uh, or three bites of the apple, right? Yeah, well, I think we're going to get 